Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Graham Campbell, and I'm the Senior Beef and Sheep Technologist here at Caffrey. Uh, you're very welcome to our third Northern Ireland Sheep Program WebEx event. Uh, as stated previously, it was my intention to hold a number of these events out on farms this year. Currently, due to the pandemic, uh, that, that can't happen. In the event of technology let us down tonight, please note this event will be recorded, and the link to the recording will be emailed to you in the coming weeks. Please note that throughout tonight you may experience some connection problems, and if you do, just please hold on, and uh, the broadband will pick up again. You have the opportunity tonight to ask us questions. Uh, you can submit these through to yourselves. Laptop users can submit these uh, using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If you're using a mobile phone, you can access the Q&A option via the three dots which appear when you tap your mobile screen. Uh, we will try and answer a number of these at the end of the event. In addition to this, we would like your feedback into how we're, how you think the event went. A short survey will be available at the very end, and we would ask that you complete this in order to give us an indication uh, on how we can. And I will provide further details at the end. Tonight, we have four panel, panel speakers. Uh, we have again, Sen and White. Senan is a Caffrey Beef and Sheep Advisor, and is also the Northern Ireland Sheep Program Manager. We have also uh, Clement Lynch. Clement is our uh, program farmer uh, tonight. We have Darren Carty. Darren is uh, a livestock specialist with the Irish Farmers Journal. And finally, we have Des Fitzgibbon. Des is a veterinary surgeon with the uh, Cumber House Veterinary uh, Clinic in Claudie. Uh, Des is Clement's vet, so Des will be uh, relating to Clement's uh, sheep enterprise tonight. So you are all very welcome. Uh, in addition to this, we have two other panellists, and that is Ronan and Pamela, and they are there to provide us with IT support uh, and the likelihood of something goes wrong. Okay, so just to briefly recap, uh, as I said, this is our third event. Uh, it has been almost seven weeks from the, the last event. So just a, a, a quick recap. The first event took place on the 2nd of July, uh, and we had just over 150 attendees, which was excellent. Uh, Parik McNeil, one of our host farmers uh, from Anna Clone, provided us with a background to his sheep enterprise and talked us through grassland management on his farm and introduced us to some of the technologies and changes he has made to the business over the last number of years. Uh, the second event took place on the 9th of July, uh, and the host farmer was Mark Davison from Dungannon. And again, Mark provided us with a background to his enterprise and did focus on finishing lambs uh, for slaughter. Uh, at that event, we also had uh, Kenny Linton from Dumbia and Terry White from the LMC, who provided us with a, a background to selecting lambs to meet market requirements. Phelan O'Neill from the Irish Farmers Journal was also present and concluded with a very detailed insight into the sheep and into the future sheep markets and highlighted some of the key challenges which we face ahead. Recordings of the first two events are now available and we will be emailing these through to you in the very near future. Okay. In relation to tonight's event, uh, because it's been seven weeks from our last event, we are going to provide a very brief background again to the project, just as a recap. Uh, and then at that time, we will hand over to Clement. Clement Lynch is an upland sheep farmer from Claudia and County Derry, uh, near Park Village. Clement is also involved in Love Lamb Week, which is taking place from the 1st of September to the 7th of September, and I will touch on that at the end of the event. Tonight, Clement's going to provide us with a background to his sheep enterprise, and again, we'll highlight some of the changes he has and hopes to put into place uh, over the coming years. Clement will introduce a short video which he has produced on his farm and will focus on the importance of assessing yews and rams pre-breeding at this time of year. And then Des will go through some of these key in more detail uh, as, as we go through. And Darren and myself are there to answer any questions in relation to the programme uh, and as we're one of the project partners. So thank you very much from me. At this stage, I'm now going to hand over to Senan. Clement and Des, uh, and thank you. And as I said, any questions, please submit them, and we will try and answer as many of them as we can at the end. Thank you. Thanks very much, Graham. I uh, hope everybody's well this evening, and we're keeping safe. Uh, as Zeg, Graham said, just a, a brief run through what we're going to be doing here this evening. Quick introduction to the programme again, a recap. 
Uh, we're going straight then as soon as we can into uh, speaking to Clement and Des. Uh, take home messages and then any questions at the end. Um, there will be some drone footage and say the RAM uh, videos as well. So I would uh, like to thank Kieran Mealy from the Journal uh, who uh, went out and uh, did that there on Clement's farm there recently. So thanks very much to Kieran for that. So say briefly the program, program background, as I say, folks, it's a collaborative partnership between Dunbia, uh, part of the Don Meets Group, uh, the Farmers Journal, and ourselves at CAFRA. So it's a three-year program uh, with the overall objective to deliver more money into farmers' products uh, pockets um, by showing uh, latest technologies and also uh, demonstrating best practice uh, and management techniques. The program farmers, uh, that was a photograph we were taken at Dunbia last year. So we are a uh, is a split 50-50 uh, between the upland farmers, of which you see Clement here on the top left, and you will see Carl and Peter McCall on the top right, which we'll be uh, visiting in, on the next uh, event. Um, and then we have our lowland farmers, um, just uh, we have Mark on the top right and Porig uh, middle right, uh, who we visited there previously. So those are the farmers. The overall focus areas, as we've chatted about before, there are eight of them. We've already covered a uh, 0.5. Uh, with Porig, uh, grazing management, the Morgan Prowess number seven we did with Mark, and so tonight we're going to be focusing on the breeding profitable sheep and genetic improvement with um, Clement. So what does that mean? Basically, you know, we are looking at things that will increase the level of output on farms and, and increase the, the income on farms. So some of those things that we were looking at with Clement is the recording protocols and especially uh, the use of EAD, which Clement uses quite a lot. We're also looking at the benefits of you know, purchasing rams with EBVs, um, both physical and uh, EBVs as well. Uh, looking at the areas of maternal new breeds and also in all things, both financial and performance, we're looking at baselines and you'll see some of the targets that we have there uh, in the system as well. So again, Briefly going through each farm, as I say, has their own farm goals. Um, these are some of the ones that we've seen before. And each farm, as I say, would encourage all farmers to have some sort of farm gold uh, that they keep they keep to. So folks, that's as brief uh, background as I want to go over. So now the main the main part of the evening, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Clement, Clement Lynch. Are you are you there, Clement? Yeah. Yeah, so good evening, Senna. Good morning, Clement. How are you getting on? Not too bad, Grant. Good man, good man. <laughs> right, Clement, we'll, see, we'll start all these off with a, with a photograph so everybody knows who it is. And there's a saying, like, behind every man, there's a, a good woman, and two here anyway, so maybe you could tell us a bit who we're seeing here and a bit about the family. Uh, well, I'm Clement Lynch, and uh, this photo here is that's my wife, Siobhan, and my daughter, Una. And Connor, I was one son, Connor, he wasn't available on the day the photographs were taken, so... He would help out in the farm as well. So uh, that's that's the family. Both all my wife and two children both all were are all work full time. So uh, I I work on the farm f full time myself. But and they help me out in the evenings and the weekends and uh, probably at busy times like lambing and things like that. There they would they would do their share of work at that stage. Well, that's good. It's uh, a family farm. So. So you have your 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 sheep only farm then, Clement. You always been there. Yes, I, I've all, I've always been a sheep farm. Yes, only sheep. Uh, I that's what I'm saying. All my land is severely disadvantaged area in the Spurns. Uh, where I live here, we seem to get a very heavy rainfall, uh, so doesn't probably suit cattle. So that's why I, I stick to sheep. Uh, I run about 500 joes, a uh, mixture of Suffolk, Texel, and mules. Suffolk Texel mules and Scottish blackface. Uh, I keep about 130 replacement dual lambs, and I would probably top about 50 of them. Okay. Uh, I, I farm f uh, about 210 hectares of land in total, 54 hectares of a grassland, uh, 155 hectares of a trough land and hull grazing, and it would be uh, spread over a number of land parcels. Yeah. Uh, like most most land around here, uh, the by share of it would be owned, some of it leased and some of it rented. Fair enough. Fair. And we're going to show some of that now briefly in, in a wee minute. So this, hopefully everyone can see um, on the right-hand side, Clement, this would be your the home farm here. Yeah, that's uh, right. The home farm, that's where, where the, the sheds and all are, so that'll be the main part. Um, so what I'm going to show now, folks, is a wee, a wee drone footage here that was taken. Maybe, Clement, you just tell us this is taken from the, the home farm, uh, and hopefully this will play okay. 
Yes, this, this is uh, drone uh, drone footage that uh, was taken a couple of weeks ago, uh, just showing uh, the yard and and some of my like the land. Uh, my land's all below uh, below the road there, so there's some of that fence there would not be mine. Uh, my land comes in there along a cloud field again, uh, and then comes back around to join up at, beside the yard again. That's okay. Yeah, that's, so that's, yes, that's, that's a, that's quite a big field there, Clement. We'll maybe chat about that later on. So that's that's where the main main yard is, and then your silage and all them things as well. So yeah. that's excellent. So as I say, we're just talking. We'll briefly go through here. Like you have several land parcels here. We're just showing, just to give people a, a, a flavour of the issues that you say a lot of farmers in the area are land is all over the place. So um, let's hear some of the mountain as well. Um, some a wee bit more. So how do you manage your sheep, Clement, with that? Like how do you like they're obviously in other bits. How do you work that? Well, uh, I, I have a, there's one one area. I have one area of, of sort of substantial piece of land together uh, at the centre of the photograph there, and I would have handling facilities there. But the rest of them, I would just use a, a mobile. I have a mobile pen or mobile yes. handling system, and I would use that there for working the stock and most of them other bits of land. Very good. How long have you used that, Clement? I have that there. So I. 2005, I think, about that, and I have a sense. And you couldn't do it, either, really? No, certainly not. Uh, it's, uh, that's what I'm saying. It's hydraulically set up there. I can lower that down to the ground, and then I just set up the pens. I can, you could go into the field, set that up in five or ten minutes, uh, and you probably would have the work done on the sheep. Uh, by the time you would have them walk to somewhere else, or walk to pens, or take, you know, put on a trailer and through to a yard somewhere. So. Yes, it's a, it's a great job, and I can, like I've seen, I can do everything on it, weigh lambs, foot bath, anything I have to do can be done on it. Because that is one of the things, Clement, like we've mentioned with with all the rest of the boys, and I think we've talked about in the programme, is labour and help and the whole thing, and you're no different, really, to you say you have help at the, the weekends and the evenings, but you need as much okay. efficiency as you can. Yeah, that's right. Uh, labour labor around here is very scarce. Uh, so yes, most of the work I have to do, I do myself. So uh, I have to try and make it as easy as I can, especially when you get a bit older. <laughs> yeah. Oh, plenty of years yet, Clement. Plenty of years yet. Um, so maybe we just go on a bit more, a wee bit about the farm here, Clement. Uh, just the, the type of yews you mentioned the type, but then what way do you do with them? And, um... I run about 150 Lanark type blackface yews. Uh, that have been nearly like the nucleus of my stock. Uh, I would top about 100 of them with back to your lanogram. Uh, the other 50 would be topped with a blue laster. Um, I would keep all the replacement lamb, yew lambs from both blue laster, my mule yew lambs and my lanark lambs. Uh, I would top my blue laster yews then with a sulfogram, which would produce the suffolk yews, and that would be the main part of my flock uh, and that would be created in the fields. Uh, and that's why I keep a few textile bread yews, but not, not too many. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, I have kept, I have a, a close flock as number of years. Uh, I keep my own replacement ewe lambs, and I now keep my ewe lambs purely on figures. Uh, looks don't matter. The the rubber the whipbreds, the heaviest lambs, and the lambs that uh, have a daily life weight gain for the first six weeks or eight weeks of life. That's over three hundred grams a day. That's that's my ewe lambs. Yeah, I say we will. We will be coming back to that, Clem, because obviously we, with your yeah. the EAD, you have you're very strong on that, and yeah. have a, a a screenshot later on, folks, so to show exactly where that where that comes from as well. So, and then the final one there, Clement, your your lamb yeah. indoors again. For yes, a lamb, a lamb, all my sheep are lambed indoors. Uh, again, back to my land being scattered. That's it's not practical sometimes to get around at all. Uh, I have pretty good facilities for lambing. I have. About 110 lambing pens, small individual lambing pens, and I probably would have facilities then to hold 100 plus yews and bigger pens, you know, and grip pens, 10, 15 sheep and lambs together. Okay. Uh, and uh, the benefit of that, I would probably try and hold them for a couple of days after the lambs so that when they're put back out to the fields, the lambs are a wee bit stronger and they need less attention. So when they go out to the fields, I don't have to run after them to make sure that they're with their mothers. Yep. 
Very good. Well, say so we have now, we were talking about them, your crossbred yos, Clem. So we have again another wee bit of footage here of, I think, the day you they did this as well. So this would be some of your crossbred yos, Clement, that were actually, and they were in for the purposes of the video. So we'll see them again. But um, maybe tell us a wee bit more about them, Clement. So these are. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would have about 300, well, I have 250 of, uh, of those type of yews, uh, and that's what's saying, they'd be mostly Suffolk mules, Suffolk and Amsterdam mule yews, and a few textiles out of Suffolk yews, and that would be the main yews that would be kept around the fields. Okay, yeah. I say that they were in for a wee while, so they were glad to get, glad to get out to get a wee yes, they, were they were standing in from the night before. Yeah. Um, and then, as you say, that's your crossbred yews, and this, these are some of your, your lambs, of your, your horn yews then, Clement? Yes, right? That, that, that's right. That'd be my horn uh, ram lambs, and uh, probably a share of uh, mule ram lambs. Right. And then another, another main asset on your farm behind them there, which you couldn't do without them. Oh, yes, the dog. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Very useful. Yes, Good as three or four, man. <laughs> and then finally here, Clement, we'll have what have we got up here, up in the, up in the hill here, up in the mountain? That, uh, that, that that would be my Suffolk and Texel bread use again, uh, and when I would after weaning the lambs, them use I would go through all them use any sheep with good body condition I would put to the hull after weaning, uh, and that's a share of them there. Yeah. Uh, any the lighter use then would be probably held in the fields just to get a bit of a better attention to so they could gain a better body uh, condition again. But it's just uh, showing like you are using the hills, like you know, and it is. It is oh yes, yes. It is, it is a main uh, part of your farm, like you know, and it's yes, uh, that that hill there. I would graze hoggets on it in the spring of the year. They, they would come off it at this time of the year, uh, and that's them crossbow yews go to it. And then the other main hill I have, uh, that's where my lanark yews would be grazed. Right, excellent, excellent. Well, Clem, as I say, we've, we've mentioned that everybody within the programme has, we've sat down at the start of the programme and said, you know, what are the goals for each farm between yourselves and myself? And you're no different. Um, and I say, every there's there's several ones of these, but these are the ones maybe we want to focus on. The, the same theme seems to be coming through, but maybe just run through some of the comments. You have other ones, obviously, but we're just going to maybe mention these ones tonight. Well, yes, Lyman, Lyman is, a, is a big part of my programme. Uh, I have all my soil tested a couple of years ago, uh, and the pH I would would be lower than I would want it to be. It, my pH levels would be anywhere between 5.7 and 6, and I would like to think of that up to 6.3 in most of it. So uh, liming's a big part of it. Uh, last year, I got on about 60 tonne of lime, but then the, the back end of the year become very wet, so I didn't get anything more done. I have about 80 tonne of lime put on so far this year with the plans of getting another 60 tonne on over the next couple of weeks. Uh, that would be the liming. Uh, paddock growth, uh, my plans, I haven't done any paddock grazing yet. I have uh, ro like rotation grazed this year, keep shaping patches and move them around, but my plans would be now to get the paddocks fenced uh, and get water into them. Uh, and I have started to measure grass uh, just to get used to the system and probably to make a lot more use of it from the spring of the year onwards. Uh, uh, just to est establish fields that probably needs a bit of attention, needs uh, probably ploughed. So uh, if I measure, I know what fields are producing good yields of grass and what that isn't, and that will determine what I, what I plough and what I, I reseed. Excellent, excellent. And the reseeding, as you say, will be something later on. Um, yeah. But so basically, what we've come here again, this field, because I say this is pretty soon. Now, some of the lambs here, Clement, um, and I viewed this earlier myself, and it is a big field, and this is maybe one you're talking about paddock, and, but also as well, I've noticed some of the lambs are different marks on them, red and blue heads. Maybe you'd tell us a wee bit. But, sorry. Well, again, uh, to try and cut down on my labour, I, when I weaned my lambs, everything was put across the waybridge. Uh, and I split the lambs up into width, width brackets. Uh, I painted the blue headed lambs there would be 43 kilos plus. The red headed lambs would have been 40 kilos plus, up from 40 to 43. There would have been other lambs there with probably blue shoulders on them that had, they were 38 to 40, and red shoulders was 35 to 38. Uh, and when I, after I had them weaned, I batched them into batches on that width and I also split them between the ram lambs and the old lambs. Uh, just simple to cut down when I, I was trying to get lambs away. Uh, 
I, I just had to get one batch of lambs rather than go through and weigh in a number, a number of lambs. And the only, then the other batch of lambs, I would just weigh them every maybe two to three weeks just to see what their daily life weight gain was to make sure they were thriving okay. Excellent, excellent. As you say, that's something you're doing, Clement. When you bring them in, you're you're doing a job, and if that cuts out, doing that wee bit extra work at the time, it'll cut out something later on, and that's 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 excellent. Yeah, that's one of the that's big right. ones. So again, Clement, like everybody was said, every with all these programs, all right, talk. Yes, you do things, but you need targets, and these are some of the ones we've chatted about. And again, some of them will 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 maybe go over briefly because we'll, we'll be talking about them later on. But some of them, like these figures, you're very came from obviously from your benchmarking as well, but the, your scaling and things out there, obviously with your EID, um, you're very, you know, these are very accurate figures. So let me just chat through some of them, Clement. Yeah, uh, the, well, the cross scan scanned about 183%. Uh, my, my, then I, I topped about 50 year lambs and they scanned about 1.224. Uh, Happy enough with that. If, if I had a lamb to every ewe lamb, I would be more, would be, I'd be more content with it. My hill ewes are 1.36. Uh, and I have a bit of a problem there with barnness, which I've been trying to get to the bottom of with day as my vet this last couple of years. Uh, I would like to see that rising a bit. Uh, to get my targets up and my cross produce to 1.9, um, you know, there's a, probably a, a slide later on we'll be looking at where, where I can move there with very, very little effort, uh, just uh, having my sheep in the proper body score mm -hmm. when they're going to their rams, I, ca I can achieve that. I, I don't know whether I want to go much above 1.9 because I, I can deal with a certain amount of triplets, but uh, with my labor situation, two million uh, is work that uh, I probably can't, no. I can't, I, I want the time to cope with. No, that's excellent. That's excellent. Um, the store lambs are um, you have none. Like everything, everything goes, everything goes down the line. Um, is that is that continuing, or maybe you go to change no, that? Or, or I, I probably will look. I probably will look at changing that. Uh, this year, uh, this year I have sold some lambs as ewe lambs, uh, and I probably will look at maybe selling off some of the smaller lambs. Them store lambs are good to trade this year, so maybe take advantage of that rather than uh, keeping them on eating the grass that could be more useful to my ewes. I think like, 10 extra lambs next spring is probably better than grazing 100 lambs on later on this year. Exactly. No, you have to look on ahead. And the final one here, like the gross margin, uh, Clement, um, 300, you know, yes, there's a fair wee bit of scope there. Like with a green, yes. Um, but your three areas, Clement, is your grassland, you know, getting your meal bill down, and basically getting numbers up. I think yes. that's the, the big, we've, we've, we've chatted through that. So if you can get those done, and you say some of them things can be done very easily, um, like the, the condition scoring, um, and I say the barnness rate, we'll bring them days later, or we'll chat the days later about that. You know, that is something that I think can be quite easily to get to, get to that level. And yes, you'll, you'll obviously, that's a, st a starting point and, and to keep going with that. So that's fair enough. Some of these obviously, you know, we, we've chatted about anyway, uh, Clement, your barn rate is something, especially in the hill use you mentioned. You want to you want to look a bit more into that. Yeah, I, I've, well, I, that's something I've been looking into this last couple of years. Uh, well, since I've done my uh, animal health plan, uh, and at the beginning we looked at I blood tested my barn use a couple of years ago to find that I had uh, there was toxo there. So I vaccinated all the use for toxo, and I've vaccinated everything since that with toxo. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, I had a, I had a, I had a pretty poor, uh, a pretty high barn rate, uh, I think about 18%, which I wasn't happy about. Uh, last year, I blood tested the, the mules before they went to the ram, or a month before they went to the ram. Uh, and their vitamin mineral levels were okay. They were just a bit low in iodine. So I took action to, to, uh, to do that. Uh, but it's, again, I think it may be something in them Lanark mules and it's something I would love to see a bit more research and development done into it. Uh, yeah. To see what you know, is, is there an underlying issue there over them? Yeah. Well, the one uh, thing I do, Mark Clement, is that like, using the EAD, like there's no prisoners in terms of statistics. Is there? The figures are there. If a yo doesn't have it, it goes down. Whether she doesn't have a lamb, whether you had some issues maybe this spring um, with, I think we might be a bit of abortion, or you don't yes. know because unfortunately. You know, I couldn't, couldn't get any, I couldn't get into the lab. Yeah. That's right, and that was frustrating. I know for you. Yes. Um, 
But that's what I'm saying. Like, there's no point in hiding, Clement. I think you would say whatever there is, there is. You need to investigate and just say, oh, you know, that's the way it is. Yes, that's right. And and that, I think that's that's the benefit of having pretty good records. When I sat down with Dave to do my animal health plan, I had pretty good records of what was going on. So uh, that's why I, th- I feel I've, I finished up with a pretty good health plan yep. because, because we looked at we looked at where the issues were and, and then see, see what we could do about it. Yeah, yeah. I'll say we've, we've just mentioned there the genetics, or we've covered that. So that is where you're wanting to get more from the grass and get your meal bent down. So that's where yeah. you're coming in to, to look at that as well. So that's that's brilliant. So the next wee bit, um, I'm just going to show this slide, and we're just going to focus on the first point, and then there's a couple of wee photographs that we've taken, and then we'll come back with the same thing on the second point. But I'll let you run here. EID, Clement, is your is your thing. So why have you done it? How long have you been doing it? What any issues, problems? I I first bought my EID recording system, I think it was 2015, uh, and I didn't do a lot with it that year. I just maybe weighed, like recorded a few weight lambs, uh, weight gain and things. Uh, then the following year, I I didn't I didn't weigh my lambs at, when they were being bought at birth, but I weighed them at the first dosing or first uh, probably five or six weeks old. But since that, I have tagged and weighed my lambs at one day old. Uh, I find it a great you know, I find it a great job uh, when it comes to picking my replacement old lambs. There's very I, my decisions made just purely on daily life weight gain in that first eight weeks. Uh, I also use it for uh, any sheep that gives a problem, anything of this uh, short of milk, poor mother and small you know, small or poor lambs. I I would put a comment into the recording system, and every time I would click that sheep's tag number, uh, that message would come up on 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 my data recorder. And when I'd be picking my ewes at the back end of the year uh, for for cast ewes, they would be going. I think I'll uh, see that wee bit in the video uh, yes. later on. And um, just when you're talking there about the ewe lambs, so bizarre. Oh, God, I don't like tagging ewe lambs, or sorry, don't like tagging tagging lambs. Any issues with that? You know, at birth, what I mean, you know, any what do you do or anything to any problems well, or. The first year, the first year I tagged, I just tagged the lambs and recorded them, and I had a wee bit uh, of bother with infection in some of their ears. But since that, I just now I keep the tags and the taggers and a bucket of a dental, uh, and I tag the lambs. I have no issues whatsoever uh, with any any uh, bother with infection. Uh, yes, I would lose an odd tag. I, I would say one or two lambs and a hundred probably would maybe be missing a tag when they'll be going. But the retention and the tag, the the retention would be pretty good. But I would be careful in how I tag. I tag in the front of the ear. I tag out just about an inch from their head, and I find no no problems whatsoever with it. Excellent, excellent. And see, this is your bridge here. Um, that's yes. your your way head there. The the yellow part for anybody doesn't remember familiar with that. Um, right, you're at it four or five years. Anything, any lessons you've learned? Anything you would say to somebody? Who's maybe maybe cover this again, but just anything you think that. Would you do differently, or no? I, I think the, the best lesson you could have is don't don't be don't get too deep into it at the beginning. Uh, take it gradually uh, because it could overwhelm you very much at the beginning if you try to do too many things and it doesn't work out. Uh, and I think do a couple of th- things with the with the data recorder. Uh, get good, you know. Get used to doing it. And then from then on, move on a wee bit further. And there is learning. Uh, I know last year I tried to link uh, kilos of live lamb to my ewes, but I found when I went to start to do it that you know the system only allowed, I had to weigh my ewes within 11 days, I think, of weaning my lambs, and I had weighed them slightly earlier. So when I went looking for that information, it wasn't there. But you know, th- them's the wee things that you have to do to, to get, uh, that, that's a learning. Yeah. But I think it's just, don't try to do too many things at the beginning and uh, take your time and, and perfect something first and then move on to something else. Excellent, yeah, yeah. So basically we've mentioned that wee bit and then we'll just, um, maybe just get you to mention, Clement, the, the first wee bit here and then I'll maybe bring Des in here. I think you mentioned the soil sampling there before. Um, I think you're you're working on the lime there. What about the peas and K's, Clement? Uh, my, my peas would be pretty good. Uh, most of my land would be threes and fours. Uh, a few, a few twos, but my peas would be pretty good. K would be low. 
a lot of land than ones. So uh, that's something I have to, I'm trying to address. I meant to do it last year, but again, because of the wet back end of the year, didn't get uh, pot ice sown. But my plans is that now to sow probably about half a bag of pot ash to the acre right over all the fields just to try and get that up. As you say, that's going back to, and that's the fundamental, as we discussed, of getting grass right. You know, we can all talk yes. about all the genetics today, but the grass has to be right. Um, I might just at this point, uh, we've, we've chatted about Des, or, and hopefully still still there. Um, you, you and Des are a great working relationship, and, um, you know, it is a very strong thing, and it's something we've always encouraged uh, a vet not to be, you know, as there as a fire, firefighting service, but to be there as an advisor. Um, Des, um, maybe you just come in here. What do you like with Clement? You've been working for a few years. Um, the animal health plan. What did you discover, or what things would you would you recommend? Or yeah, well, well Clement, you can hear me all right, yeah. Yep, hundred percent. Okay, I'll no, just switch it on. Now, Clement um, discussed the, t the 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 two main findings there was was uh, suboptimal fertility in the in the in the hill sheep, and then the other thing was we identified iodine deficiency. The other thing was animal health plan, because Clement has such good records, you know, he does a lot of fecal egg counts through the summer, is looking to reduce anthelmintic use, he's, he doesn't want a problem building up of anthelmintic resistance, worm resistance in, in the flock, because he's benchmarking his performance targets, it then it means whenever, if we do fecal egg count, that only records, that only picks up mature worms, worms have to be mature and laying eggs, now a lot of damage can be done by mature worms, if he's monitoring his his performance, performance is a good as good an indicator as to whether you need a worm dose as as a fecal egg count would be. And if you combine the two together, we can turn around to Clement and say, okay, you know, you don't need to worm dose just yet. You can hold back a couple of weeks, save some money, and it also reduces anthelmintic resistance. So that that was the other big friend, and we found it. That's, but you need somebody with keeping records of the quality that, that Clement's keeping. That, that, that's what makes all the difference. Yep, yep. I would say obviously with EAD, that's excellent, but it doesn't really matter. You know, any sort of recording. Yeah, it's not a sort of recording system. It just means yep. you, have, you have, to, have to get in there and do it regularly. It doesn't matter yep. if it's written or a piece of paper, that'll do us. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, the other thing, and I, um, I know you were looking at it, Clement, maybe with, with the OPA, which is something that we're uh, highlighting through the programme as well, Clement. Um, and again, we'll be highlighting next, the next version. Um, how, you've, you've had your old scan, Clement. Yes, I scan my yews in the spring of the year. Uh, my my, my cuspid yews were pretty good on it. I'm just looking here at, at my thing, uh, I had 0.8 of a percent uh, where what uh, scanned as definite uh, OPA cases, like which were excesses uh, when we we done it. Uh, and then I called them yews were all called. Uh, now my my black face yews and my lantern type yews was higher. I had 5.9 percent there. Uh, I had no no cases in my ewe lambs or my rams, uh, so I I will look at now probably scanning my black faced ewes again now every like for every six months for a couple of years to, just to see if we can get that down a bit, uh, and I'll probably leave my cross ewes and just scan them on a yearly basis, uh, because I, I I don't see you know I, I, I don't see a big issue there. Yep. Uh, Oh, that's good. The, the, the surprising thing about it was that I had yews. There were some of the yews went to 109 pound a piece when I sold them. Uh, like they were ex, they were condition wise, they were excellent, but rotten was it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's and that's that, the, yeah, that's what we said. Like you know, from what we've done, and again, we'll we'll highlight that next the next time is that you know just because she's in good order, Clement doesn't necessarily yeah. mean she hasn't she isn't a, a big burden and also committing a problem as well. So basically, again, we'll just briefly go through this wee bit, Clement. You're, you're as well. You're also part of the, the EFS scheme, and uh, you have been using. We say we've, maybe we've talked about the plate meter there. So the EFS scheme, Clement. I think that's mainly done around the, the home place here. Yes, that's right. I have. Uh, I, I went into the wider scheme there earlier this year, and I have uh, a fencing program to do to, along the river bank. Yeah. Uh, yes, where you're where you're on the long way, right, the whole way along, uh, and I also then have. Uh, Water means to go through the fields, uh, so I get them through the fields, and then my plans are to tee off them uh, water mains and to provide uh, drinking troughs then to sit where I'm going to paddock grace. Excellent. That's the plan. Uh, I haven't started that work yet because I have a few hedges to trim back to get the fences done and things. 
Yeah. And I can't really do anything there until after the 1st of September. So my plan is in the next couple of weeks to get that done. Good man, good man. So there's a job there for anybody that wants to. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, now to get on, Clem, because we've done this for most people. Uh, one of your kill sheets, um, there is another one there, we just didn't get a chance to get it uploaded. But this, again, was for the information that's coming back. I'm coming back well from the factory. Um, and it, it, you know, basically follows through from what you're, you're when they leave on the farm to how they do in the, they do in the factory when they're hung up. Um, yeah. maybe just, this is one of your kills there not too long ago, Clem. Maybe you could tell us how they've been killing out. Uh, They've, they've been killing. Yes, I, I think I, that's about the fourth batch of lambs. I think I sent away. Uh, now, I, I've been killing my lambs at a lot lighter weights this year compared to, to last year. That was one of the things that come up in my benchmarking figures. Uh, four and a half thousand pounds worth of free meat. Uh, that's a lot. And, uh, that's a lot of meat. So uh, my plans were kill kill them earlier. Uh, that batch of lambs there killed out, just looking at here, um, they were about 19.9 kilos, I think, dead. Um, and they, they killed them to 95.25, I think, it was money wise on them. Uh, and I just, at the time, I, I took a, they made the decision that I was going to kill them slightly lighter, because like someone killed them even 17 kilos or 17 point something. But, uh, like them lamb, I killed I killed a batch of lambs a couple a week or ten days ago there, and they died a kilo heavier, and I'm four pound a piece less for them. So it was a good decision to 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 sell them at that. So that's that's what I do. Um, the recording system again, I I go back and I look at how they kill out. Uh, my, the first batch of lambs I sent away was about the 20th of June. They died they died out about 49 percent. The second batch died out about 47 percent, which was about the beginning of July. But since the weather's got damper and things, yeah. uh, I'm back now at about 44 percent kill out. Yeah. Well, that's, that's not surprising, Clement, and that is something no. you know, this this the weather we have, and you know people need to make their decisions, and you know there's plenty of articles and stuff there to go on to that. So that's yeah. excellent. So Clement, we'll just maybe go on now. These are the dead ones, so we'd like to move on to to maybe the living ones here. So what do we have our I have your uh, replacement new lambs here that you've we've chatted about, and I say yeah. we have a wee slide next uh, about uh, where you use your data to to pick those from. That, yes, that's a batch. Of, there's 76 uh, Suffolk new lambs, or a few textiles on it, uh, and that's my replacement new lambs for like my lowland sheep this year. Uh, again, again, just packed solely on those lambs have a live weight gain of 0. 360 grams a day live weight gain for the first. Uh, Eight weeks, so they're around 50 days or 51 days of age. That's and that's that's a, a well, part of the data sheet that yeah. come off the system. Uh, I would run them lambs over the way bridge. I pick them out. Then I would, uh, as I, you see them maybe at the top of the thing. There, it says 2020 July your lambs. I would go back into the system and look at them. And if there was anything below 300 grams a day, then them I would record them tags and them lambs would be pulled off them again and they would be them lambs would be sold. So you were saying maybe there during the week, Clement, like uh, if anybody's not sure, you see on the right hand side, like, this is all your daily live weight gain. So for this one here, about 0.418, so that's 418 grams or 0.4 of a yes. kilo, 41 of a kilo. You say at the start there, like adding over 0.3 of a kilo, you're looking at, but I suppose this gives you the flexibility to say, well, I'm, I can be a bit more tight, a bit more, I can that's raise right. my bar, so to speak. That's right. That's that's that, that's what I done because yes, I had a better choice. had a better choice. Like my, uh, my all my lambs had done probably. There were very few lambs below two, were, were below three hundred grams a day. So yes, my bar, I raised my bar slightly higher this year. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So we're going to go on. Now. We mentioned there earlier because we we're soon be coming into the condition scoring bit and then the video. So the bit you mentioned here um, was another screenshot was of the the colios that you mentioned earlier on. And again, this is your 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 systems enable you to do this. Maybe just chat briefly through this, Clement. What we're looking at. Uh, yes, I, I just asked the, the program to print me out uh, a spreadsheet of anything that had comments wrote against them uh, from where OPA one. Uh, when I scanned the use for for OPA, there were OPA one, which were probably very very doubtful sheep. OPA two could have been slightly doubtful. And then X were for de they were deafness, and then sheep were all called. But so OPA one and OPA two, uh, them use are still there, uh, and they, I will test them use again for OPA 
when I'm when I'm doing my my horn goes again. The, the other ones, uh, there's a couple there. What to see where it is? One, two, three, four, five, and six down there. You see other look. Uh, and a date of event, the 25th of March and the 20th of March, those would be sheep that probably were short of milk when they were la when they lambed. So I just put, that was a comment was put against them, uh, recorded onto that other recorder. And it, every time I every time I click on that sheep's ear tag, that message comes up. So them sheep them sheep have all been called. Yeah, and we would see that now in the wee video. Yes. So that, that's it. Right, uh, sorry, the OPA one and the yes. OPA two. You'll see them maybe later in the video too. There's a tag in their ears, but that's just simply for to know know the old ran. Have to go through all the sheep and all the sheep that that yeah. scanned at that. Yeah, makes makes sense. Makes sense. Right, Clem, I'm going to let you a wee rest uh, for a wee minute. Um, we have a couple of slides here, folks, just to talk about what we're actually the main part of this evening is actually we're getting ready for the for the mating season. Um, and we'll just go through a couple of wee slides here, just a wee bit of technical stuff about it. So all I would say is as soon as the lambs are off the yews, that's the time you need to start thinking again about uh, getting ready for mating again. So what you're trying to do is basically the yews have enough time to get back into shape uh, for mating again. So what is all that about? Well, that's assessing their body condition score, and that's that's what we're talking about this evening. So what it is is basically seeing how well the yew is and how your nutrition is reflecting in the yew's condition. Um, so what you're doing is mainly a quick assessment of the amount of muscle um, uh, and the covering the backbone and, and the short ribs, and it gives an, a, an indication of the energy that the yew has. And then from that, you'll be able to say, well, I need to feed her uh, for for mating and or as you're going through the through the, the pregnancy period, feeding her for uh, whatever she's carrying as well. So it is, it is a very useful tool. This is just a wee pictorial thing. And I say, folks, all this will be recorded, so don't uh, panic. Um, the scores basically go from one to five, one being very, very thin, five being very, very fat. Um, and you'll see here scores two, three, and four, but we will be chatting to that um, in, a wee, in a wee minute or two. So basically what you're feeling, and what Des will show in the video, is, is the basically how easy can you feel the, the backbone and the horizontal processes, which is like the ribs. So there are would be like industry targets um, that we would have here for different types of you know, systems, hill, upland, and lowland. Um, and you can see the targets here as well. And Clement, you have a slightly well, it's not different, but it's just your system of, of, of scoring. And we'll have a wee spreadsheet here of, of what you've done. Let me just tell us through that, Clement. Yeah, this, this spreadsheet was last year, just before tapping time, or when I was starting to use to go to the Rams, I, I body scored all the O's, and I just I body scored them one, two, three, four, and five, one being thin, two being probably slightly, thin, slightly short of condition. I would have probably thought was pretty okay. Four was probably slightly fat, and five was very fat. Uh, so then, when I scanned the yews in the spring of the year, I went back and looked at, at these grips just to see how how they scanned. Now, my body, the, the Suffolk yews were body scored too. I them sheep were grazed for another ten days longer before the, the rams went to them, so they probably had gained another bit of body condition. But body score two and three scanned come out there at a, a 182 percent, which was just like uh, one percent below where my average was for them batch of yews. Uh, body score five was down another, it was 181 percent. But the body score four was my my use them, them yews scanned at 190 percent. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, if, if I had my sheep in that body score four, I could raise my lambing percentage to 190 percent with with nowhere with very very little uh, changes or, or anything else. That, you know, just having them at the right body score. And then the the bottom two are my mule yews, which is uh, body score three and body score four. And again, it's very similar. Body score four, 194 percent against 188, which is body score three. So I choose. The importance of having that body scoring right. Yeah, yeah, and I say, well, we'll, we'll have take home messages, and that will be one of the things we'll mention, uh, Clement, as well. Mm -hmm. Right, Clement, we're going to let you have a bit of a rest now. Thank you very much, um, folks. We're going to bring in Des here now, and I'm going to switch over to the the wee video that was taken um, at the at the at, at Clement for a couple <coughs> of weeks ago. So um, we'll just get this loaded up here now. So we'll we'll let this play here now. Just give me one minute. Or hopefully that's everybody can see that now. So um, I'll play this, and Des will just comment through as as is. And this is one of uh, Clement's new uh, additions, uh, Belclare Ram. So we'll play her here, and uh, Des, over to yourself. 
Okay, I'm just yeah, video show now. That's good. Okay, uh, Ram MLT. We talk about the five T's. The five T's to check for. Uh, the first T is tone, which means body condition score, and also general muscle condition. You know, the strength of the ram. But but the body condition score is the main thing. It takes up in two months, really eight weeks to to manufacture sperm. So the the ram should be in body condition score at the start of that eight, eight week period. Aim for a body condition score of three and a half to four. So just feeling along the ram's back, feeling the horizontal processes uh, that come out from the spine. This is a ram the climate bought in. So just checking the temperature just be, to be sure they arrive safe and sound. Normal temperature in sheep would be 38 to 39 and a half Celsius or else 100 to 103 Fahrenheit. Uh, just using a digital thermometer there, it's a very simple process. Now T number two would be teeth. So look at the head from the front, look for symmetry, no lumps sticking out from the side. You see where I'm running my hands along the sides there, I'm just feeling for overgrown teeth in the molars at the back, you'll feel sharp edges of teeth overgrown. So the incisors at the front, this is a, a two-toothed ram, this is a shearling ram and that ties in with a declared age. Again, checking that the, the incisors, that they're not overshot or undershot, that they're lined up with the roof of the mouth properly. Um, check the eyes, check no pink eye, no new forest disease. We're checking the, the, the pink of the eye, you just peel back the lower eyelid and you should get good salmon pink color. If you had a problem with the check, if the, lambs, if the rams low in blood, you would see a pale color, maybe even like butter, if you chronic fluke. If the ram, maybe you could pause it a wee second, Simon, could you please? Yeah. Uh, if, 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 if there were if infection there or, or if you had acute fluke, then, then the, 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 the pink of the eye would be darker than usual, it would also be bloodshot. Start it again now, Simon. Yeah. So, T number three is, is the feet. Obviously, it's not just the feet, it's, it's all the legs. You know, you're looking for swollen joints, looking for arthritis. Here, we're just checking the, 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 the soles of the feet. The, the side wall of the, of the feet takes the weight. It's not the sole of the feet takes the weight, it's the side wall. So the, the side wall, can you just pause it there too, please? And uh, the, the, the side wall should be two to three millimeters longer than the sole of the foot. And that way, they're not walking on the sole. If they're walking on the sole, then they tend to bruise. Or especially if they're on stony or gravelly ground. Where I have my finger there, you have a wee bit of hoof separation there, it's called shelly foot, and that's just dirt that's got in between the side wall and the hoof. It's not an infection, it's just a physical thing, but that dirt pushes up and eventually it'll separate the, 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 the side wall off from the foot. We don't recommend trimming feet at all for for general management, but this is about the only instance where you would trim a foot, you would just open up the side wall there, so any dirt that goes in there would, would, would go out the side and it wouldn't push up deeper into the foot. So that's T number three. Now T number four is testicles. And we're starting here with the penis with the ram's rod. You, you, you see how I'm pushing the penis out there so we can inspect it. It takes two hands to do this. So, so you won't do it on your own. You need somebody to hold the ram for you. And the best way to do it is to sit the ram on, on its backside the way we have it there. It's, it's much harder to do in a, in a standing ram. So you push the, the skin back against the penis and the penis should pop out. You, you'll see there that at the end of the penis is a, a wee appendage, a wee thing called a vermiform appendage, like a worm. And it's, it, it sprays the, the yolk cervix with, with semen whenever the ram meets meet the yolk. You need to check that, check that it's not swollen. That's a good natural one there. It's a nice pale color. You need to check it's not swollen. You need to check it that you can pull the penis out quite easily. It's, it's, it's not stuck in there, there's no pain. Now we're checking the testicles. Again, you're looking for symmetry, the same as the head. You're looking for both sides to be the same. You want a nice firm tone to the testicles. They should be quite solid, especially as you approach the breeding season. And the best description I've seen for how firm they should be, it should be like your flexed bicep in your arm when you flex your arm. It should be as tough as that, as solid as that. So you're looking to see, is there any lumps in the testicles? Is there any sign of pain, any sign of inflammation or heat? Can you feel any fluid around the testicles? Because you shouldn't really. If you can feel fluid around the testicles, you'd be better to get it checked out in case it's, it's, it's infection or, or, or even a rupture. Testicle size, size is everything. <clears throat> the bigger the testicles, the higher the sperm count. So size is everything. Here we're measuring this boy with a proper, this tape measure is designed for this job. Minimum requirements for this type of a ram is 32 centimeters, and you can see here he scores 34 centimeters, so so he's okay, he's quite comfortably over the minimum requirement. 
Uh, what we're doing here, we're feeling at the bottom of the testicle, you have a wee organ called the epididymis that runs across the bottom of each testicle, and it's like a, a slug. And as they come into breeding season, it becomes quite firm. And the sperm is made in the testicles, but it actually matures in the epididymis. So, so one is as important as the other. So what we're feeling here to check that there's no pain, there's no sign of uh, inflammation, that both sides feel the same. Again, that you've got symmetry there, both sides are the same. It's very important to check out along with the testicles. And obviously you, you feel high up at the neck of the bag. The other thing is clip the wool off the bag. That allows the, the testicles have to be at a slightly lower temperature than the rest of the body. And, and, and that enhances sperm production. It also reduces the chances of, of infection building up on, on the bag. So clip the wool off the bag. So, so this is Clement has a mixture of, of, of yo's here, just illustrating body condition scoring. So again, if you run your hand along the spine, can you feel each individual bone in the spine? For ideal body condition score, it'll, it'll just feel like a smooth ridge. And again, you, you feel the sides where, 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 where the bones come out from the spine, just at the top of the flank on each side where my fingers are now. And again, it should be like a, 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 a smooth ridge. You shouldn't be able to feel each bone individually. If, if you can feel each bone individually, then you would say the, the O is under conditioned. Um, Clement has his own marking systems and these. Again, just checking teeth. When you have them there, you know, check everything. And so again, you check, you check the neck here, ADS, what's that for there? Yeah, yeah, we're feeling on the jaw here. We're feeling the glands. They have glands in their throat the same as humans have. And we're, there's a disease called CLA, Casey's lymphadenitis. You might have heard of it. It's not something you want in your flock. We, we, we really see next to none of it around here. There's no treatment for it, but it's, a, it's like OPA and yonis and all these, what they call iceberg diseases, they, they get into your flock slowly. And once they're in there, they're very, very hard to treat. They tend to pass on from generation to generation. So, so always keep an eye out for that. If you do get an animal with swollen glands on, under the jaw, then, then isolate it immediately until you get it investigated. So again, just check and feel over the ribs as well for body condition score. Here, I'm just feeling down, feeling under for the other, just checking for, for, for lumps in the other. I think we might bring uh, Clem back in here, Des. Thanks very much. We'll get you in again. That's the, the red tags, Clement, you were mentioning there. Yeah, that's right. That's that's the tags I put the sheep just uh, to highlight the, the ones that are OPA, just if I was picking them out again uh, to to test them again. And this is, I'll just maybe pause it here briefly. Uh, hopefully you can see that. That's your OPA there, Clement. Yeah, that's, 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 your, that was one of your OPA ones we've seen from the... the yes, the that's right. And there'll be another one here, I think, Clement. Yeah. This is your handheld reader, obviously. Um, there's another one here. Well, this, this is other now, so that's yes, that that's a, that's a yo that was probably short of milk. Uh, and this is her here. Not, uh, because the entry was put in on the 20th of July, that was probably a yo that the system threw up that reared poor lambs. Yeah, but this, this is her uh, here, Clement. Now it doesn't look like the wrong one. That's her. She's perfect, perfect mouth, perfect daughter. Uh pretty good body condition. Uh, but rear two poor lambs. Yep, and say so that's that's the benefit of of keeping the condition or sorry keeping the information there that you you say oh I'll, I'll mind her but you don't always remember you know so. Thank you very much with that. So that was the video. So really, we're at the near of near of the end, Clement. So where is Clement's farm going? Where areas do you want to look out for the future, Clement? We've we've, we've talked about a few here. Um, maybe you could maybe go through some of them. Uh, yeah, develop the paddock grazing system, yes. Uh, that field, first field in below the yard there, there's a six acre field, and the, the field next to it that the lambs were in was as an eight acre field. And my plans would be to divide those up into, uh, well, three two acre paddocks in the first one and four two acre paddocks in the second one. Uh, and and th th that'll be like seven paddocks, probably graze that as a, just as a section on its own. And then probably the other fields on around, I, I get another seven paddocks out of it. Uh, just grow, grow more grass and utilize it better as, as where I want to go. Uh, I think for I worked off farm for a number of years uh, on on a build, on building sites, uh, and probably for a number of years it was handy to go out and put out a creep feeder and throw meal to the lambs. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably profit didn't really matter that much at the time. Uh, but now I'm at home here and it's my source of income. So it does matter now, and that's why I have to change. And sometimes change isn't the handiest, yeah. but uh, 
my plans. Like this year, this time last year, I had about 40 or 50 lambs away. I have 227 lambs away this year, just from probably better grazing management and, and you know, trying to have my grass right, graze the fields down. Uh, on one of those fields, just the where the paddock grazing is, I think I showed you photographs last year of two parts of the field where the grass was pretty long on one of them and it down to the stump on the other. Uh, and I think if, if that was paddock, if I had that divided up into paddocks, I could probably force the sheep to graze it out better. Yeah. Uh, I would have better quality grass. I also, when I do my paddock system, I'd probably have a look at putting in creep gates into them so that I allow the lambs to creep to move to graze uh, in front of the ewes. Uh, so that that's that's where I'm coming from, more from grass. Excellent. And the AD, uh, maybe a wee bit more with it, uh, Clement. Yes, I, I. What I would like to have, my, I would like my ewes to be trying to root out, to be ruthless, and and uh, when I go to pick my ewes for for sale or to get re- you know to for breeding again, anything that gives any problems. Uh, gone or any poor performers gone, uh, and the idea would be that I would have a batch of ewes that would rear to, scanned and rear two lambs, plenty of milk, little foot problems, uh, and that will cut down on my workload. I, I think uh, I would look at it and say I have 110 lambing pens. Uh, for me to go around those la- them pens, if everything was okay, I could probably go around them pens in an hour. Mm-hmm. If I had 10 sheep in them pens that had needed attention to get, feed a lamb or suck a lamb or something like that there, there where I would lose a couple of hours, and that's time I don't have at the minute. So that's the, that's the line I want to go down, try and go down with. Yeah, and that, that, like I said, the maternal line as well. And now we yes. haven't mentioned here, but just when you're talking about that in labour, it's a thing you haven't done, but you've you've started to do it a bit more, is get more contractors in as well. Would that be something, you know, to do bits yeah. and pieces where you can? Yes, I, have to, yes I, I took in contractors to show fertiliser and, and spread slurry this year, uh, just to get get a job done when I needed it done. I, I probably could have done it myself, but it took me much longer. So uh, when I sued my early fertiliser, while he was sowing the fertiliser, I was putting up the lamb and pens. Yep. So uh, I was getting two essential jobs done at the one time. Uh, and that's, yes, that's where I'd, uh, I have to go down that road a bit more. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. So then we'll just maybe the last two points are uh, Rams with EBVs, Clement. You'd be very, as, as everybody in the, in the programme would be very much on for that, you know, and it is something we want, and we'll probably discuss it later on. I'm sure there'll be questions about it too. So, you know, buying tips with EBVs, Clement, be something. Yes, I, I, would, I would try and buy tips with EBVs, but that's one of the disappointing things in the sheep industry in Northern Ireland at the minute is the lack of rams coming on the market with EBVs. Uh, if you want to buy a ram with or EBVs, you either cross the mainland or go down across the border to the south. Uh, and then that is added, you know, go across the mainland, it's getting them transported back home again. Go down south, they have to be blood tested to get them back up again. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's, it's not the easiest. Uh, I just looked at, at the premier textile or the premier Suffolk gram sale was in Ballymena a couple of weeks ago there. Uh, and there was there wasn't a ram and the catalogue had, had figures on it. Uh, yet there was two pages at the back of the, the catalogue explaining how you understood EBVs, but but there were no stock there with them. And and that's a very disappointing aspect of pedigree breeding in Northern Ireland at the moment. Mm. As you're, you're coming from a commercial farmer wanting to buy, wanting that information. Yes. Yes, there's a two way flow, and we say we'll probably we'll discuss that as well. The, the barn rate, obviously, we'll, we've chatted about that, eh, Clement. It is something that you, you're looking to, do, to get sorted out uh, yep. in conjunction with DES, and you know, you're looking at the OPA, and we're going to be looking at other things going forward as well. So um, that, that's excellent as well. Well, Clement, I think that's. You're a bit, you can sit back now, have a drop of tea or uh, a coffee or something for a wee while. Um, now, folks, I'm just going to finish off with some take home messages uh, from this evening and then we'll be hand back over to, to Graham for any questions. So, folks, basically, what we'll say that we've gone through it this evening is Yo served, and, and Clement has shown that with these, with these figures, Yo served at the right body condition is the first thing to get lamb numbers up, uh, your lamb percentage. Um, the mo- second one, obviously, as we have here, is doesn't really matter what the records are. Good breeding records, whether paper or electronic, are a massive step to help you 
uh, move your system on and, and improve profitability on the farm. Again, where you can, um, you know, purchase rams both on physical and with formants for figures, if possible. Um, you know, as the Clement has articulated there. Um, and I'm going to go rig days in here in a wee minute as well. Um, you know, do your ram MOT early. You know, that's your own tip you bought in, tips you bought in, or your own tip as well. Um, and also, I would say, you know, with your vet, to make sure you have a good almond health plan. Des, maybe just something there we mentioned, like you've done the RAM MOT before uh, going to the RAM. I think maybe you have another wee point to add to that. Yeah, no, well, obviously, again, the RAM's going to go in with the O's. It's going to suffer a lot of wear and tear. It's going to lose a body condition, a lot of body condition. Do your MOT again when it comes out. Sort out any problems there and then, and that gives them the rest, you know, up in a year again to recover for the, for the next season. Don't throw them to the side and forget all about them and then problems fester all over the winter into the next year. Check him over as soon as he's away from the O's again. Excellent, excellent. Thanks very much. Um, as, I say, as I mentioned there, you know, speak to you know, speak to the, the Dezes of this world. Um, I think, Des, you'd be more than happy. Farmers coming to you like the way Clement does uh, yeah. regularly rather yeah. than coming and saying, look, I have this this way. <laughs> what are you going to do? Give yeah. me something. Well, that's uh, that's all the difference you see. You, you just get a, a much better chance then, you see. Yeah, that makes your job easier and yeah. you know, more rewarding. And then finally, Clement, I'll leave this last point to you. Yes, uh, handle, handle the use uh, regularly and, and avoid surprises. Uh, I think nature is a great way of working, and I think it, for a sheep to put on conditioning things, the best way of doing that there is over a, a long period of time or over a longer period of time, not maybe finding out a couple of weeks before you go to the ram that they're thin and have to put maybe meal in them or try and do something with them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the other one is, you know, that not only before they go to the ram, I think it's also very important that, uh, well, from my point of view, uh, before at lamb time when I would house the sheep, I would handle them ewes every fortnight uh, for condition. And if a sheep, even a ewe that was scanned with a single lamb, if she was losing a wee bit of condition, I would maybe move her to the pens that would have twin lambs and give her a wee bit of extra attention, or a twin ewe moves to a triplet pen. Uh, for the same for the same thing, because uh, it's it's easier to keep condition on a sheep than try to put it on her. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. Well, well said, Clement. An excellent point, Clement Des. Thank you very much. Um, that's our bit for this evening uh, in terms of presenting. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Graham now. I'll say, folks, thanks very much for listening. I'll say, if have any questions, um, we're here. So, Graham, back to you. Yep. Okay, Simon. Thank you very much. Uh, Firstly, Clement, thanks for an excellent overview of your farm and uh, for a very professional way you answered the questions. were certainly excellent. Uh, I'd also like to thank Des. Des is a busy man. Thanks, Des, for giving up your free time tonight to assist with this event. Very much appreciate it. And also thanks to everybody who produced them videos, Kieran Bailey and, and the IFP team. Uh, the videos were excellent. Super way of explaining uh, we wanted to get across so excellent and also the drone footage was fantastic so thanks to everybody who has been involved there as you have been speaking people have been busy we have had a pile of questions coming in here and we are running slightly over time but i feel it's important we get some of these questions answered here so i'm going to just fire them at you uh, at random here uh, i'll maybe start off with Senan, uh just in relation to uh Body condition score in yours. How often do you feel yours should be body condition scored? Well, as, as Clement was doing there, as often as, as you're getting them in would be ideal. Um, that's not always possible, but uh, you know, as the wee thing on the slide, there at least four times a year. You know, when you at weaning time, before, well in advance of tipping, uh, you know, um, lambing time and, and mid pregnancy as well. Because I think Dale's mentioned, you know, it takes about me a couple of months for a yo to get a yo up on good grass from say a two to a three. So. You know, if you don't have that, well, then you're in the meeting. So, you know, as regular as you can, quick hand on any time you're bringing them in, but at least those four times a year. Anyway. Yep. Okay, Sam, thank you very much. Uh, Des, I have quite a few questions for yourself here. Uh, firstly, in relation to teaser rams, uh, can you just highlight the benefits of running teasers? What breed do you think is the best? And briefly explain the protocol uh, in relation to teasers. Uh, that question has come in a number of times. So, Okay. Yes. Well, the recommended breed would be a Dorset or a Dorset Cross because you're going to be using them in, in advance of the breeding season. So you want the ram that is basically in, in, in full musk. You know, he's, he's got a good strong smell of a of a top off him. Um, 
you need to prepare your teaser at least eight weeks before you need them. It takes them that long to get over the operation. Uh, ideally, you would operate on them as a ram lamb, and that, that, that's our selfish perspective because it's just a much, much easier operation to operate in a ram lamb than it is on a, on a shearling ram. It's, it's, they're miles apart, you have much less complications. It's a much quicker, simpler operation. A teaser will go in for 17 days, one simple. You can put a teaser in with up to 100 euros. Remove them then. Now, you think to bear in mind, your yo's are going to be brought forward. They're going to be synchronized to some degree on the back of that. So you've got to be very sure of the RAM that you're putting in. After the teaser then, they say the demands on him could be a bit higher than usual. So you need to have done your MOT on the RAM and be sure that he's fit for the job then after the teaser. Yep. Uh, perfect, Des. Thank you very much. Des, just when you're there, fertility testing of RAMs, uh, what's the best time to do this? Yeah, again, you got to see if you do it too, too far in advance of the breeding season, the ram's going to be naturally off anyway. We're not a huge fan of it, but we would put the emphasis on the physical examination on the MOT because that, that will pick out at least 90% of problem rams. Uh, as regards fertility testing, you're either going to use a probe or else you're going to sponge you and, and, and put the ram to her 40 hours later and see if he will then give you a sample into an artificial vagina, which not all rams will do. The other thing with fertility testing, if you're using the probe, it's quite sore in the ram, and, and about 18% of good rams will not perform to a probe. You won't get a good sample. It could be diluted with urine. It's just not 100% reliable. If you use a yo with an artificial vagina and, and the ram agrees to it, then that will be a more reliable sample. The other thing with the probe as well, you're forcing the sample into the ram, and it means it doesn't give, tell you if the ram's got any sex drive. So you can have a ram with a good sperm count, Put them out with the yo's, you could just walk away, wouldn't be interested in them. At least if you, if you sponge your yo, that would tell you if the ram has sex drive on top of having a good sperm count. When, like I said, we would put the emphasis on the physical examination. When, when, when would you go for a sample? When would you sample a ram? Well, if you had any doubts from the previous season, that would be one indication. Another indication would be if you had any doubts from the physical examination of the ram. So if you thought the testicles, the testicles were a bit small or they weren't firm enough, if you thought it might be lump there or an abscess or something like that. Also, because it takes eight weeks to manufacture the sperm, let's say the ram happened to have any episode of illness during that eight week period, especially if it happened to run a temperature for a while, if it happened to have a wee bite of pneumonia, or something like that, that would interfere with the sperm production. That would be another indication. But uh, as regards to using the probe, it is quite sore in the ram. If a ram has a very good physical MOT and a good history behind them, and they failed the probe, then we would not automatically fail the RAM. We could maybe retest them twice more on the one day, but then we would rest them for a week and test them again. But we put more emphasis on the physical examination than we would on the on the actual sampling. You know, you, you really should pick up the, 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 as regards to getting a sample with a probe, there's too many question marks over it that you can't just use it on its own. The physical examination has to be interpreted in conjunction with what you get by sampling. Yep. Yep. Okay, Des, thank you very much. Uh, there's a wee bit of connection issues there, but hopefully everybody heard that. Uh, Clement, I was giving you a break there for a short time. Uh, a pile of questions here for yourself. Yep. You start off uh, your EAD system. Uh, You've been very positive about that, and a lot of people have been asking about what system are you using and what cost. And if you were recommend to somebody uh, to start using this system, what would you recommend to them to start with? Well, I, I use a I have a Shearwell system, or my uh, just an ordinary Shearwell data recorder and a package, you know, for for recording on on the laptop. Uh, the cost of it when I bought it was fifteen hundred pound. And as I'm saying, I have it since 2015. Uh, I don't. Uh, it hasn't given me any trouble so far. Uh, and and their their technical backup and things is pretty good. I, I had an issue last year with with an old laptop I had, and I actually contacted Sherwell, and the there was a girl spent probably six hours remotely on my on my program get sorting it out, but she sorted it out. I, you know, it was a very good. Very good program. Now, the the data recorder and the and the program was fifteen hundred pound. I also pay, uh, I think it's about ninety five pound of a year, an annual subscription for backup. Uh, because my land is scattered, and uh, you know it's not the part different parts of the land, and I have to move about. I just have used an ordinary Ritchie Weybridge 
uh, with a true test easy way seven head on it. Uh, and that that allows me to Bluetooth from my wayhead to my data reader. But um, you know, that's what I've used. I haven't I haven't had any complications with it so far, and I'm pretty happy with it. Okay, uh, Clement, thank thank you very much. I'm just conscious of time here, folks, but I have a few questions yet here I want to ask. Uh, Clement, when picking new lambs, do you keep singles at all? And if you do, what daily life weight gain uh, are you working for? Uh, uh, on my on my Suffolk and Texel, my Suffolk yule lambs, I might keep a few, very very few uh, single yule lambs would be kept. I, I would have a pretty good lambing average in them mule yules, so th th there might be a few kept. Uh, and I don't see any problems uh, with number of lambs reared since that. Uh, on on my mule yules, I actually looked at those as, this year there for a couple over the last two three years. Uh, now my mule yules, I would have shared a single lambs in them. Mule lambs because of the hull sheep and they'll be grazed on, you know, them lambs will be grazed on the hull. Uh, my lambing percentage actually on those singles are slightly higher uh, than twin bred ones. Okay. Yep. So no, I don't. I don't have any pro. I don't have any problem. I, if I had a good yule lamb, I would. I would start. I wouldn't have an issue keeping it. Uh, what what weight I would keep? What I would keep it? I, th I think that most of my yule lambs. Uh, well, the, the, whatever number of single yule lambs I kept this year, they're at uh, 0 0.39. Uh, okay, yep. Really lightweight game. Yeah, very good. Uh, okay, Clement, thank thank you very much. Uh, Des, I have another question here. There's a, a lot of questions coming in about teasers. What's the best time of year to get uh, if you if you want to buy a lamb for a teaser? What's the best time of year to get that lamb uh, doddered? Yeah, at, at least eight weeks before the breeding season. Okay. At least it, you know, just to, to allow tissue to heal to get over the operation, and, and that way it means too. You, if, if you have any doubts, you could you could also jump the teaser just to be sure that it is definitely a teaser and that the operation hasn't gone wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, Clement, another question. Uh, you mentioned there in the presentation uh, that you vaccinate your arms with Sitvax. Uh, do you do the entire flock, or is it just the arms? Uh, and what I know. I've just I've just done the arms. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. I would have very little problems with foot care of foot problems. Uh, I would have a pretty regular foot bath there. Uh, so I, I, I would have very. I would have very few sheep with poor feet. With poor feet. Uh, but if I did, I did have any of those there. Yes, I would have no problem foot uh, doing them with foot bags. I find that the couple of years that I used it, uh, it was pretty good. Yep. Okay, Clement. Thank you. Uh, another darn. I'm not letting you off lightly at all here. I have uh, a few questions for you. Uh, Darren, what level of benefit can performance record actually achieve, uh, and is it worth investment and work required? Yeah, I suppose, Graham, uh, we have a very good example from what Clement is using from it there, but he also made a great uh, comment as well during the presentation of this, not to say we can get awful hung up about performance recording, we can get very much, I suppose, maybe hung up in the detail and let it overwhelm us. Uh, like, to me, there's there's probably something every farmer can do and start, say, with small steps, uh, like even even something as simple as, say, taking, marking some lambs now, uh, weighing them again, seeing how it's going and, say, daily live weight gain, it, it, it's a starting point that can bring benefits. But what Clement has, I suppose, is your roads right system and where you really want to get to if you're going to invest in the system. But if you're going to go out and spend a thousand, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred pound you really want to be going from birth recording and also recording, say, back to your sire as well. Because otherwise, you're not going to put that investment in if you're just getting, say, the daily live weight gain of lambs, say, post pre weaning, post weaning. You really want to be going the whole hog at that. And at that, Graham, you will see the benefit. In particular, I think that from picking, like, Clement showed one little thing there that was, it was a serious aid to me is that. There was a yaw that he pulled out. It was the 27th of March, was her date. How many people would, after weaning, put her hand under that yaw? She had a perfect udder. She was in perfect condition and she looked great, but yet she'd weaned two very bad lambs. And I think that, uh, to me, there is untold uh, benefits that can be got, but it's what suits the system and what's the most you can get out of it. Obviously, it suits bigger flocks. But smaller flocks can still get going with yeah. a level of performance card. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, and Darren, just leading on to that, the longevity figures for Rams uh, is awful in some cases. You know, is there more we can do to improve on that? Yeah, uh, I suppose. Look, it does hit the nail on the head there. That like, there's a couple of things I see, and look, at, uh, I think this pedigree breeders are at fault in regards to this. They're probably breeding sometimes with a shoring, uh, as opposed to commercial farmers. But as commercial farmers, we're also at fault as well, because if any of us go into a, a ring and we have to be truthful with ourselves and we see maybe grass-fed rams there that are the fraction, say, as strong as other rams, we automatically think there's something wrong with them. And also there's a bit of a sports perception of, Feeney, we couldn't have our neighbours or someone else seen us buying one of them rams. We're not fit to go and and, and pay for that. That this and and we have to be truthful of that. This that it is. I think it's an industry issue, Graham. That I think that to get more longevity in rams, that the whole industry needs to turn. And look, at it is slowly starting to turn. We are seeing even in the sheep Ireland sale there uh, last week, there were some grass-fed rams presented as hoggets. A few years ago, that would have been sort of an un unforeseen. Uh, you wouldn't have seen that happen. So it's slowly starting to turn. In regards, just maybe a quick thing that can be done, uh, I think, is just like we see that we've no problem maybe paying three, four, five hundred, up to six hundred pounds for a ram. Uh, let him off with a load of yours, and he might stay with the yours so many times until maybe after Christmas, and it's the scanning time you're putting them away. And Des made that point there is that you take your ram in after. And to me, once you've bought a ram before and after, it's a small investment to maybe even to say to yourself, I'm going to put five bags of meal to that ram before breeding or after it. And it just gives them an awful lot to bring on for the longevity. But look, it's an industry thing we have to tackle, no different than EBVs. Yep. Okay, Darren, uh, excellent answer. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Clement, a couple of uh, practical questions for yourself here. Uh, in relation to uh, paddock grazing, you, you talked about splitting them to larger fields. Are you going to use permanent fencing or are you going to use electric fencing or do you give that any thought at, at this stage? Uh, I'm, uh, Graham, I'm probably going to use a mixture. I'm probably going to divide them both uh, down the middle with a permanent fence and then subdivide again with electric fence. Uh, okay, Dar or Clement, sorry. Thanks, Clement. Uh, Clement, just um, managing the, your upland area, uh, have you ever considered uh, paddock grazing parts of that or, or fencing parts of it off to hold the sheep in uh, tighter areas? What, what's your thoughts on that? Or how, or how do you manage that upland area is maybe the best one? Uh, well, uh, Graham, that's back to you know bring your own replacements and things like that. There, I think uh, you know if you the people who go out and buy purchase shows to go to a hill or go to somewhere like that, there they're they're not what I would call haunted on it, haunted on it. Uh, you know, so you know my owls have been born and and reared on that hill, and and I would have a pretty good spread of. Uh, of yews across the hill, so they would graze the hill pretty well down. Uh, on most cases, now them cross go to the hill. Yes, I would have a problem there. They they would be more tempted to graze the lower parts of the hill than, than the higher parts of it. Uh, and yes, probably a fence and pro something uh, fence wise there would be a benefit. Yep. Uh, yep. Maybe that's something we could look at in an environmental scheme sometime. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Or you have the other option of a uh, new, relatively new technology as virtual fencing. That's something I'm, I'm looking at at the minute, and that's, a, that's another option for managing these upland areas with, with livestock. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of questions again, uh, and then we're nearly finished here. Do you recommend flushing yews? Like, what's your? Yeah, well, I prefer to to do what Clement is doing, where you focus on body condition score. Yep. I mean, flushing is a bit of a, it's a quick fix. And and when you do things quick in nature, you cause stress. And nature doesn't like stress. So uh, what Clement is doing there, focus on body condition score from weaning. Do it slowly. If you meet your targets along the way, then there should be no need to flush. That'd be my opinion. And the, the, I think the latest research bears that out. And I think Clement has found that as well, haven't you, Clement? So. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yep, I will consider that superior to flushing. I mean, okay, flushing is a last minute fix if, if it's the only option you have. Yep, yep. And is there a benefit in giving, uh, you know, breeding new bulls uh, coming up to top time? What's just your thoughts on that, Des? Well, again, it's a short term fix again. And if, if, if you do your blood samples and you don't need it, I wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. 
I wouldn't be doing it. You know, I don't think the research supports it. No. There's yeah. everybody's bombarded with ads. There's so many products on the market you couldn't count them all. You know, but they're, they're all one. They're all doing the same thing. But whether they're benefiting or not, if they don't need it, I wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that that, that is key. Blood sampling. You know, that's where yeah. everything has yeah. to start from. You know, and you must uh, consider that. Clement, uh, a quick question in relation. You mentioned there maybe about introducing swale into your uh, alios. What's your thinking yeah. behind that, uh, Clement? <laughs> Well, I, th I think I think it, the first benefit will probably be trying to get lower the barn rate and the yields. Uh, I'm just going to I'm I'm, pro I'm going to put a swill ram through the, um, all the horned yields this year, uh, and and probably just use them once. On you know, I, I'm not, at one bay I wouldn't go and this way I just go half red the swill to the lanark and just use it, use them once on it. Uh, just uh, they are a good yo. Like I had swill yo's years ago, they were always good mothers. Uh, I, I, like I recall back, like I'm talking 20, 30 years ago, where I would swill yews where they were tucked on the hull, and I would have been lambing with 125, 130 percent lambing, uh, you know, and them yews would have been on the hull from after the lamb up until February time, and they, I'd probably just come in to, just come home to lamb. So that's that's where I'm going. That's where I'll be looking to go into the swill for. Yeah, that's grand, Clement. And you talked about labour efficiency. Uh, have you ever considered outdoor lambing? Or did you ever try outdoor lambing, or is your, your systems maybe sort of old indoors? What? I yes, I I, I did lamb. I did lamb. I, I put up the, she, the sheep house in nineteen ninety five, and up to that, the, all the sheep were lamb outside. Folks, apologies. There seems to have been a technical issue there. Thanks to everyone for sending in the wide variety of questions, and thanks to our panel for dealing with them. Uh, I hope you found this pre-reading event useful and have gained some valuable tips to put into practice in your own business. If you are a business development group member and have a, any further questions in relation to assessing yews and rams pre-breeding, please contact your local CAFRI advisor. If you have any questions in relation to the programme, please contact either myself, Senan or Darren. Please note Event 4 will take place on Wednesday the 7th of October, commencing at half seven. This event will provide a background to OPA and will highlight the importance of, of OPA scanning. Programme participants Peter and Carl McCacken from Bally Castle will be the WebEx event hosts. Patrick Grant, the sheep vet, will also be in hand to discuss the OPA issue. Further details will be sent through within the next couple of weeks. As previously mentioned, Clement is involved in the 2020 Love Lamb Week, which takes place from the 1st to the 7th of September. We ask that you actively promote this initiative as it provides consumers with an insight into the importance of lamb production in Northern Ireland and encourages consumers to try local lamb. Finally, I want to thank everyone once again for all their help and support preparing and delivering for this event. As mentioned earlier, we have developed a survey for you to help us improve these events going forward. Please complete and do not shut down. The survey will appear automatically. We look forward to seeing you back in early October and we'll send details through to you in the coming weeks. Thank you.